time gap and the mcqs although the nature was similar but uh, because of the options or uh, confusing is that why it was more difficult Yes. Sir, in numericals we had to use the direct results, but in MCQ we had to think analytically, or we had to. So that was difficult. Yes, yeah, so uh, overall trend. So marks it is reflected clearly. I think uh, second part the highest is about fifty seven. Whereas in the plan, sorry, the MCQs I use the highest is below forty. My memory serves me right. So maybe today or tomorrow you will get to see. Your own test paper on metal. If you didn't want to share it yesterday because possibly you had some exams, hopefully today or later tomorrow we will get to see your own papers. Right. Uh, any feedback midway through the semester? Anything that you think should be corrected? Suggestions, anything? Uh, sir, there was a question in numerical that uh, how the number of different homomorphisms between S6 and Z23. So, uh, how to do that? So, you tell me. Anybody wants to try this? The answer is one. So, it means all maps to identity, I think. Yes. That. Yes, that's the only homomorphism possible. Can you figure out why? Sir? Yes? Sir, uh, it was asked that homomorphism between those two groups. So, mm -hmm. and uh, I think uh, uh, two will be answered because one from Z23 to uh, S4 and other will be S4 no, to no, Z23. No, no. S3 to Z26 or was it S4 to Z23? S6 to Z23. S6 to Z23, okay. Not Z23 to S6. But no, the no, question no. was homomorphism between, not homomorphism from S3 to Z23. So I was, I was confused. Uh, when I say between A and B, is for homomorphism, it means A to B. Uh, okay, let me see. Uh, let me try to see from your perspective as well. Uh, let's see if there is any merit. But as far as Sanket is asking, it is S6 to Z23. There is only one homomorphism. So, how would you justify that? Sir, means uh, I I also don't know. Means I I was able to find only one in all maps to identity. Right. So that will of course always be the case. But could anybody think of a reason why that should only be that should be the only homomorphism? What sort of a group is Z twenty three? Order of element in Z three and order of element in S six. Order of element in Z23 will be? Only 1 and 23. Yes. You can see Z23, by the way, is a cyclic group, right? Yes, sir. And order as. The order of any element in Z23 is either 1 or 23. 
Okay, so remember the result about homomorphism. Okay. Order of A and order of FA, what is the relation? Yes, uh, order of F and divides order. Divides order. order of, and order of F A here is either one or twenty three. And that's of course a prime number. So therefore, therefore the only homomorphism possible is the trivial homomorphism. Oh, okay, okay, sir. Right. So, uh, I mean, we, I think we provided the solutions uh, sooner or later to all questions, the question paper, or any general feedback about the course, anything that you want to suggest so that the course experience will improve. If that is the case, please do so. Otherwise, we will continue. Sir, uh, group of uh, there were too much questions from group of symmetry, uh, and uh, <laughs> it is too much too difficult to understand that group. So, uh, in fact, today I will tell you why that is the case. Sarthak, I understand what you are saying. Yes. Uh, there is a reason why uh, why permutations, right? I think I think you mean permutations, right? Yes, sir. Got that, and I you'll get the answer maybe in the next ten minutes. Any other feedback of and the course so in the general? Yes, Pandan. Question of uh, an exam as well as in last tutorial about uh, means more than one generator of some group. So uh -huh. is, that uh, is I didn't understand means we have taken two elements and we'll generate group from that. So how? Uh -huh. Will work. How in the sense you can take all possible operations of one element, of the second element, and between these two elements. That is what it means. Uh, so, sir, uh, let's say A and B are two elements, then huh. uh, group generated by it will be uh, A raised to N dot B raised to M or exactly. some yeah, yeah, yeah. combination so of N and B. Where n and m can be any integers. So if n is 0, then it is only b raised to m. If m is 0, then it is only a raised to m. n and m both can also be non zero. Means uh, some string only contains a and right, b. Right, right. Yes. Okay, sir. Okay. And of course, not only A raised to N, B raised to N, but it is, I mean, here you had assumed when you were saying A raised to N, B raised to M, that A and B coming to each other. If that is not the case, then it is, as you said, a string containing A and Bs in any number. Okay? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, again, I was expecting some general feedback but anyway that's okay let's get started it's not well too much over this so uh, yeah today scribes group number 13 id number 75 are you there yes sir 76 77 yes sir 78 79 80? Yes, sir. Okay. okay. I can clearly see the attendance is slightly lower. The students are tired of exams. Anyways, let's get started. Right. So I straight away try to answer Sarthak's question. Why do you encounter a lot of questions? that are on this topic, permutation group, right? They said, what is so nice or so important about this? Okay, so let's pick an arbitrary group G with the binary operation denoted by a dot. 
Okay, and then let us choose one element and fix it. Okay, that element could be any arbitrary element, but once you have chosen, right, you fix it, you don't change it. So let's call that element as small g. And using that small g, let us define a function whose domain and codomain both are g, okay, the group g. So we we'll denote that function by tau g. Okay. And it is defined, sorry, so there is a typo here, this should be tau small g. Tau g is defined on any element of the group g. So if a is an element of the group g, then tau g a is nothing but g dot a. Okay, so I hope the definition of this function is clear to everyone. Yes. So, now, see, this is a function defined, consider G as a set. Okay, forget the group for now. Okay, then what is this tau G doing on capital G? How do we see it? And what are its properties? This tau G. Permutes elements of G. Permutes elements of G, or if I want to take it, uh, break this down, break this conclusion into smaller steps, is tau G one to one? Yes, yes sir. sir. Yes, sir. I, I hope that is clear. Tau G A equals tau G B. That implies T dot A equals T dot B, which by cancellation. Okay, and similarly, if this is one to one, how about on to? Yes, sir, on to as well. If P belongs to G, then there exists an A to G such that g dot a equals b, right? Therefore, tau g of a equals b. Okay, so since it is this function tau g, right, is 1 to 1 and on to, that implies tau g is a permutation. Right, come up again. Once again, Are we? Didn't we hear you properly? Could repeat. I don't know enough. So uh, I hope it is clear. Since the function tau g is one to one and on to, that basically means it is bijective, and we have seen that any bijective function can be seen as a permutation. Okay. So this tau g is therefore got a permutation okay now so g was one element right using which we define this one function what happens if i look at the set of all such functions obtained using each and every element of the group right so let us look at this collection of tau g's as a function from g to g for all small g's belonging to the group. So basically for all group elements. Since it is a function, let me also equip this set with a binary operation, which is your composition, function composition. Then the question is, is this set along with the composition operation a group? So what are the properties that we need to verify? Let's do it one by one. Closure. Closure. Let G by 
DNA is the element of the group. Okay, what is tau T composed with tau H? Oh, oh, the dot H. Yes, but remember you have to show it. This is equal to tau T on H dot A is equal to T H A. That is nothing but using associativity is T H A is tau T H A. Okay, and T H is of course an element of the group. So tau T H is an element of this set. Next. Universe. So let tau t belong to this set. Let us call it S. Then, since G is a group element, T inverse also belongs to G, and therefore tau t inverse is in S. Is tau t composed with tau t inverse? Tau B or the identity map. Okay, so the inverse is also there. Associativity, I think uh, all of you, I hope by now, agree that function composition is associative. What's the fourth property? Identity. So we should have done identity before inverse, of course. But the identity map will be tau t. Okay? So this is a group, right? What is yes. so special about this group? What does it contain? All the permutations. Contain permutations, right? Now, we have already studied permutations of this set G, right? And what are the permutations on G? What is this? Sir, Sn, where n is order of g. Right, or you can just write Sg, right? Sg or, or S order of g. What can we say about the set S that we just wrote here? Now g, g. What is the relation between S and Sg? They are isomorphic. Are they isomorphic? Okay, somebody else. Yes, this will be a subgroup, I think. It is a subset of SG. It is a subset. Because one done, what he said is, it is isomorphic. Isomorphic implies they have to have the same number of elements at least to begin with. Right? What is the order of this set S or the cardinality of this set S? You have one function per group element. So order of G. Order of G. Whereas order of, of the number of elements in S G is order of G factor. Order of G factor. Yeah. So, of course, they cannot be isomorphic, right, unless G contains only one element or two elements. Okay? Yes, sir. So, what can be said about S and SG? S is a surely a subset of SG, but can we say something more? Sorry, it will also be subgroup. It will also be a subgroup of SG. Right? 
So this we have already proved, isn't it? What is a subgroup? Subgroup is a subset which is also a group. So that is what we just did in the previous slide. Okay, so set S is a subgroup of S. I hope everybody is following this. questions here? Is this okay? Yes, sir. Okay. So then, right, so what we have shown is, it is a subgroup of this G. So what will be the next statement? What can we say about, so if, in, if I call this set as S, what can we say about G and S? They are isomorphic. They are isomorphic. And can you define the isomorphism? Or can you show that these are isomorphic? Like F map F from G to tau G. F from J to S, F, it maps J to tau G. Tau G. Yes. Okay. Is this an isomorphism? So what do we need to show for this map to be an isomorphism? So it is a bijective homomorphism. Right. So is it bijective? Uh, yes, sir. Yes. I think to show that it is bijective is easy. How about homomorphism? So what is f of g dot h? By definition, this is tau g and g h. This I think in the previous slide we derived this is also equal to tau g composed with tau h. Right? That tau g by definition is f of g composed with f of h. Okay? So, yes. Instead of F, I'm using phi. Okay, but shown that this map phi. I'm defining this way phi g gives you tau g, that is a group homomorphism. Okay, and then that implies that every group g, okay. Any group that you give me, right? Remember in these slides when we took this group G, we didn't make any assumption. Okay, this group could be anything cyclic, abelian, non abelian, it just doesn't matter. As the only thing that matters is that it's a group. So, as far as you have a group, that group can be shown to be isomorphic to some subgroup of SG. That is what is called Keeley's theorem. Okay, so we have already done the proof of this. But uh, do you see the importance that this brings right, to the commutation group? Arthak, who was asking this, is 
Does this answer your question? Why partition? Yes, if we can understand this symmetry of group, then uh, group of symmetry, symmetry, then uh, we can uh, uh, relate to other groups. Exactly. Because any group is nothing but basically a subgroup of permutation. Okay, so you can take permutation groups and study them. Study its all subgroups. You basically study any other group that you can come up with. Okay, so you can think of the permutation group as a prototype of any group. N. Sir, yes. Sir, can you show the previous slide one minute? Sure. Just give me a second. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay, so permutation groups, therefore, are very important. If you understand permutation group, basically you understand all groups. Okay. So then let's go to chapter three. By the way, if you are following the textbook. Uh, by Tiki Papantaro Polo. Whatever we did, Scaly Theorem, that is part of Chapter 4. Part Chapter 4, which talks about actions. Just because uh, this course is restricting groups to half a semester, I would not be able to do justice to this. So I have sort of ignored group actions completely and only taken parts of that chapter which helped me reach ADC. Okay, But uh, if you're following the book, theorem and its proof, everything is part of chapter 4. Then we move back to chapter 3 and the idea is direct products and abelian groups. We want to do as, again is just one result. Okay. So we have seen in chapter 2 or 1, remember, what is the relation between cyclic groups and abelian groups? So are all cyclic groups abelian groups? Yes. 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 Yes, sir. And how? And how about the converse? Are all abelian groups cyclic? No. It's not true. No, of course. Not true. Give me a counter example. You ten. Group 10 is abelian but not cyclic. Yes or no? Yes. Sure. I, mean, I don't remember it, but you mean you are right. Any other example? And the, do all of you agree that this is abelian? This, of course, is abelian. 
this is not cyclic. Okay, uh, do all of you agree that there are groups which are abelian but not cyclic? Yes. Yes, sir. Right. I mean, the example that I had was this Z2 cross Z2, Klein group. Okay. Sir, real number under multiplication? Real number under multiplication, good. Rational number under multiplication. So, real numbers, not all real numbers. Real numbers minus C. Huh. Uh, right. Other than zero, yes. R star is the billion, but cyclic Q star multiplication is again a billion, but not cyclic. Okay? So there are several such examples. So all abelian groups are not cyclic, but right, what we are going to try and do is show that yes, abelian groups are not cyclic, but they are very closely related to cyclic in the sense that we can sort of break the abelian group into smaller groups or smaller subgroups each of those smaller subgroups is going to be cyclic. So you can look at abelian group and any abelian group basically as a collection of cyclic groups, not a single cyclic. Okay, that's the last resulting group theory that we want to reach to. And let's see how long it takes for us to get there. Okay, once again. If you do not follow all the detailed proofs, it's okay. The aim or the idea is to just show that although all abelian groups are not cyclic groups, but we can break the abelian, the original abelian group into smaller subgroups such that each of those smaller subgroup is cyclic. And therefore, the original abelian group can be seen as a collection of cyclic. The aim, I hope, is clear, right? So let's get down to try and show this. And for that, we need two ways to construct new groups. Okay? The first one is what is called direct product of groups. So let me try to first explain what I mean by that. Okay, so we start with proposition number 32. Let's say we have two groups with us. Okay, G1 with dot and G2 with diamond. That's the two different operations. And there is no assumption on what is G1 and G2. Okay, they can be cyclic, they may be abelian, they may not be abelian, etc. Et there is no assumption on even the cardinality of G1 and G2. Okay, but if we are given these two groups, right, with sets G1 and G2, then we can first consider the Cartesian product of the sets G1 and G2. Okay, so I'm assuming all of you are familiar with Cartesian product of sets, right? Is everyone compatible with that concept? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Cartesian product of G1 and G2. This set forms a group itself. Okay? But the group operation, it is denoted by star, is nothing but the component wise group operation. Okay? So let's say A1 and A2 is an element of G1 cross G2. B1, B2 is another element of G1 cross G2. Then the group operation between these two elements is defined by taking the corresponding group element in G1 and corresponding elements in group G2. G1 and G2 are groups, so of course you can combine two elements of G1 using the original group operation on G1 
and similarly using the original operation on G2. So A1 not A2, right? Since A1 and A2 a1 dot b2 yes. yes. A1 dot b1 a2 diamond b2 sorry for the typo but, uh, is this understood the group operation on c1 cross c2 oh, yes, take a minute studying this and if you are convinced that this is a valid group operation, then try to prove that this Cartesian product is actually a group. So, do you want me to write the proof for this? At least the uh, Two or three main axioms we can work it out. Closure. Find this. Why will it be closed? Sir, it should not be A1, B1 star, A2, B2. Once again? Uh, shouldn't it be the shouldn't it the operation be on A1, B1 and A2, B2? Sorry, just a minute. I again made a mistake. Uh, the convention I'm trying to follow, but I'm failing, is the index one or the subscript one will refer to an element from group one. So it should be A1, A2, A1, B2. Now, does it make sense? Yes, sir. Stop me whenever I get muddled with the convention, but I'm trying to stick to this that the subscript will indicate which of G1 and G2 does that element come from. G1, G1, once again, apologies for the confusion. Hope you can see that the first element of this tuple a1 dot b1 will always be an element of group g1 because g1 is a group second element a2 diamond b2 will always be an element of g2 therefore this element a1 b1 a2 diamond b2 will always be an element of partition product of g1 and g2 Okay. Yes, sir. So closure, I guess, is straightforward. Inverse, or what is the identity? E one comma E two. E one E two. Inverse common thing. Okay. Any doubts in this? Uh, sir. Hmm? Uh, sir, here you took that A1 A1 composition B1. A1? Sir, here A1 dot B1 belongs to G1. 
Yes. But uh, sir, B1 belongs to G2, then how? The no, B1 are... belongs to G1, right? Okay, okay, sir. Good. So I can see my confusion has rubbed on to you. The idea is the subscript number will indicate to which group it belongs to. If I write A1, B1, C1, D1, E1, all of those, because the subscript is 1, they will all belong to or they will all come from the set G1. Yes, sir. So A1 and B1 are two distinct elements of first group. Yes. Okay, sir. Yes. Okay, uh, please get this cleared if you are still having any doubt. Questions here? Maybe let me give you an example of uh, what we are trying to do. Okay. So let's say one group is this. One. This. Okay. Along with. twice addition other element other group yes. you see what would be G1 cross G2 X comma Y. X and Y can be any real number. This is nothing but R2. This is group 1, group 2, entire thing is your G1 cross G2 R. Make sense? Yes, sir. Okay. So here G2 will be Y comma operation, right? Zero comma Y. So, so what was your question? So the G2 should be Y, G2 should be Y comma group operation. Addition. I comma group operation. No, I didn't understand. Where y belongs to R. Starting the definition of G two. G two contains all these elements. Okay. And the group operation is just element wise addition. So element wise or component wise. Okay, means it is zero comma y. Okay. okay. Yeah. So means I thought uh, means I I thought that it is uh, the the notation of G one comma group operation. It is that notation. Which one? This one? No, 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 sir. The notation of group operation. The notation of group that is a set comma group operation. Ah, so this is your set and this is your operation. Okay, so uh, you thought yes, this is the type of this one. Okay. Fine. So uh, now is it clear? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Right, so please feel free to ask doubts. Uh, I see you might think something. Uh, anyway, let's go ahead. This is what is called the direct product of group. Okay. F, the new group. And you can see this is like a larger group, right? G1 cross G2. It contains many more elements. How many elements will G1 cross G2 contain? 
order of g1 into order of g2 right so can see what we are trying to do is if i have two groups we can construct a larger group from that okay and later on once again to align this with our aim we will sort of take g1 and g2 as subsets of the abelian group and show that the original abelian group can be created by taking this direct product in some sense. Okay? So this is just so that you don't get lost in why I mean, how is this going to help us break down an abelian group into a collection of cyclic groups. So by the way, when I meant what I meant by collection of cyclic group is this cartesian product or direct product. Okay, so we eventually show that any abelian group is nothing but a direct product of cyclic groups. Okay, so instead of showing that any abelian group is a cyclic group, which is obviously untrue, we'll be able to show that any abelian group can be shown to be a Cartesian product of cyclic groups. Okay, so this group G1 partition G2 or G1 times G2 with this particular group operation. Okay, so that is again something to remember. G1 cross G2 is a set on which you can independently come up with a different group operation. This set with that different group operation will not be called a direct product of G1 and G2. Okay. Only if the Cartesian product is equipped with this particular group operation, only then we will say that this is the direct product of G1 and G2. Okay, now if you can do this for two groups, you can of course do it for n number of groups, right? So you may have G1, G2, so on and so forth to Gn. Right? What would be even what would be the group operation on this? Component wise group operation. Exactly. What would this be? where they understood that the group operation is using the operation of T1 here, here it is from T1. Okay, so but I hope this is clear. What you can do with two elements, you can do the same with n elements as well or n groups. Yes, sir. Okay. Then let's try to look at another way. So as of now, see G1 and G2 are two different groups, right? With two different group operations. And this allows us to build larger groups. Okay, but remember the group operation on G1 and G2 are very different and using the, these two different group operations you can come up with a new group operation on G1 cross G2. Okay? Now can we sort of use the same group operation that is the next task. So for now or from now onwards we are going to assume that the group G it's an abelian group and since it's an abelian group okay, we are going to stick with the convention that the group operation will be denoted by plus all right so g is going to be an abelian group and we are now going to consider two of its subtypes now the idea is again can we somehow take 
the product of H1 and H2 in order to get the original group G. The difference between this case and the previous case is that here the group operation on H1 and H2 considered as groups will be the same as that of the original group G. Okay, so H1 is a group in itself, right, because it's a subgroup, but with the same group operation as that of G. Similarly, H2 also comes up with its with the same group operation as that on G. And we are now going to try and see what is this eventually again. Okay. So, <laughs> Cartesian product in this particular case is what is called sum of H1 and H2. Let me define that, but it's basically the same concept. Okay. So since G is abelian, I hope you recognize this H1 plus H2. What does that mean? For some H in H1, it is added with some element H2, some element in H2. Yes, okay, and you have encountered this definition earlier also, right? Earlier, since the group operation was denoted by dot, this is basically equal to this. Or, you also denoted this typically by only H1, H2. Do you remember this? Yes, sir. Right. Now, the question or the question is, is H1, H2 equal to H2, H1? Okay. Do you remember we had looked at this question? If you don't, look at tutorial 2, question 1. Okay. We had looked yes. at this. Okay. Just that we are using a different notation. And also, this is a much simpler case. The simplicity comes because the group G is abelian. So, of course, H1, H2 will be the same as H2, H1. Okay. So, H1 plus H2, that's a small difference in notation. H1 plus H2 will, of course, be equal to H2 plus H1. Because of that, H1 plus H2 will always be a subgroup of G. Uh, is that okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Then, <coughs> what happens if H1 plus H2 becomes the entire group G? Okay, so, writing the same thing in more details, and what that means is that for every group element of the original group G, right, there will exist two elements. One, let's call it H1, that will come from H1. The other, let's call it small h2, that will come from the subgroup H2, such that if I perform a group of the group operation between H1 and H2, I will get G. Right? Yes, sir. Okay. In other words, as is obviously written on the slide, we should be able to decompose G, right, into sums of two subgroups H1 and H2. Again, trying to bring back our original aim, think of G as an abelian group. Right? The idea is 
if I can come up with two subgroups of this abelian group, let's call them H1 and H2. Since they are subgroups, they will of course be typically smaller than G. Using this H1 and H2, so again, can I get the entire group G? So this is exactly this example. Using only the X axis and the Y axis, right? can I get all points of the plane? So, the same thing we are trying to do in general. Right. Uh, is, the, is this equation understood by everyone? What does it mean to say that the sum of these two subgroups H1 and H2 is equal to the entire group G? Yes, sir. So, Bandhan has understood it. What about the rest? Yes, sir. Understood. Yes, sir. Yes, no, yes, sir. Right. So, if G can be written as sum of H1 and H2, right, then this tuple H1, comma H2 is said to be a representation of G. Okay. Again, this is analogous to the geometry that all of you and all of us are familiar with. Okay, so this is your x-axis, which is a subgroup. Y-axis, which is also a subgroup. If I take an element here, let's say 2, comma 0. If I take an element here, let's say 0, 1, I add them, get this. This element, how do you represent this point here? Two comma one. Two comma one. So you can see that this is exactly what we are doing here. This two comes from the first group or first subgroup. This one comes from the second subgroup. Okay. Now, so far we have seen that if this happens, okay, it's a big if, or, but for now let's assume this happens. And if that happens, we know that for every G, we can have H1 plus H2. Okay, and therefore, I can represent G by this tuple H1 for my H2. But, why can't G be also equal to some H1 prime plus H2 prime? Can that happen? Sorry, sir. Can you Sure. So, if H1 plus H2 is equal to G, okay, if that is true, by definition of this equation, let's call it equation 1, it implies that you can take any arbitrary element small g from the entire group G. G will always be equal to a sum of two elements h1 and h2 okay that is simply by definition now why can't the same element g also be equal to the sum of two different elements h1 prime and h2 prime where h1 prime of course comes from h1 and h2 prime comes from h2 can that happen then H1 would be same as H1 prime and H2. Why? Why would that happen? 
plus h2 equals h1 prime plus h2 prime. How does that imply that h1 and h1 prime are the same? Because if that is the case, then you are showing that h1 h2 and h1 prime h2 prime are not really different. They are the same. Sir, if we take its analogous in coordinate geometry, then we can say that they both are equal. Achha, can? Okay, let me take an example. Uh, coordinate geometry. You may think I am cheating here. But fine, I don't care. So let's say G is R2. H1 is R2 itself h2 is my x-axis or the other h1 is the x-axis as usual like as i had done in the previous example h2 it's a subgroup of g so it can also be equal to g right nobody stops now in this case what do you think Let's take the same element. P. And the point that I'm referring to is the same. Two comma one. Are there two different ways to obtain this point as a sum of elements from H1 and H2? Yes, sir. for this sort of like h2 equals to r2, then we can just get those two points. Ah, so, so, I'm trying to see when is it possible to write g as a, what is the word? The unique product of unique. When can G be uniquely written as a sum of events? When the if when H one and H two have only identity as common element. Yes, if the if any h3 belongs to h1 intersection h2 okay just a minute let me write this H3 belongs to H1 intersection H2. H3 belongs to H1 intersection H2. Then? H1, H3. I think small H1. You want this, right? H1 comes from H. H1, H2 comes from H2. Then? G can be written as H1 plus H1 plus H H3 plus H3 inverse. So H3 inverse would be minus H3. Uh, minus H3 plus H2. Right. So for this H1 plus H3 equal to H2, H3 should be identity. H1 plus H3 is equal, equal to, H2. to H1. H1, H1. Why is this equal to H1? It is not, right? If if it should be equal, like means. If, this, if both, this is unique. If this is unique, then H3 is the identity element. Okay. So if the representation. is unique and h1 
one plus h three is has to be equal to h one and h two minus h three. Remember, this is an abelian group, so I can write it as h two minus h three as well. Yes. Sir, can't we take another form such that h1 plus h3 equals to h2 and h2 minus h3 becomes h2? No, see, h2 is in subgroup h2. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Makes sense. Yes. Right? Yeah. So, okay. Right. So, if the representation is unique, then h1 plus h3 has to be h1 and h2 minus h3 has to be h2. What does this imply? Four equations imply x three has to be identity. Yes, set five. He doubts with this. This makes sense or no? Sound yes, sir. So what does what have we proved here? For that representation to be unique. So we have shown that if the representation is unique, then H1 H1 intersection, intersection. H2 equals just to. E. What about the converse? Sir, uh, in case of converse, uh, representation will be unique, but it is not uh, necessary that uh, direct product of H1 and H2 is two. Ha ha! No. So this is something we are assuming is already given that G is equal to H one plus H two. Okay, so sir, then converse is also true. Converse is also true. Do all of you agree? If H one intersection H two is equal to just E, then the representation. Will be unique. Anybody who is not sure of this, anybody? Uh, sir, I am having a doubt over here. Okay, go ahead. Uh, sir, we are uh, representing G as. Uh, Subgroup as the composition of subgroups of H one and H two. Yes. Right. So why is means so that H one and H two are considering them as unique subgroups, right, sir? Once again. They are the H one and H two are unique subgroups, right, sir? No, 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 not you. Small H one or capital H. Capital capital H one. Capital no, H one. No, this is nothing. No, 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 no. I'm not saying that G cannot be written as a sum of some H3 and H4. All I'm saying is, if G is equal to H1 plus H2, okay, in that case, every element of G can be written as H small H1 plus small H2. Right? I. Yes, sir. Means we are representing these elements of that group G. Yes. As the and sum of two elements, H1 uh, and H2. Elements, H1 and H2. Now the question is, do are there more than one pair of such elements whose sum give you the same G? Okay, means we are we are trying to determine if there is a unique unique uh, pair H1 comma H2 exactly. such that the element gives. Yes. Okay. So, okay. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Means we are dealing with the elements this time. Yes. Elements. Yes. Ah uh, yes. Ah uh, yes, sir. Then it's then it is clear, sir. Then it is clear. Okay. So uh, the converse uh, 
Can I assume you guys can prove it yourselves? Yes, sir. Okay. So therefore, we have an if and only if condition, right? Or if and only if statement. So that is proposition number 33. Let G be an abelian group with subgroups H1 and H2 such that this happens. Okay, so this is already given. Okay, don't worry about the fact that you may also have subgroups, let's say H3 and H4 of G such that H3 plus H4 is not equal to G. So we are not looking at those cases right now. Okay, but if G is an abelian group with two subgroups H1 and H2 such that G is equal to H1 plus H2, then so I'm calling this as a decomposition. Okay, this decomposition is unique. Okay. So I should maybe rewrite this. What I mean by decomposition is the representation. Okay. So the representation of every element is unique if and only if the intersection of the two subgroups is the identity. Okay, and again. Uh, the example that you should think of here is the x and y axis. Okay, or in fact, you can think of several other examples, right? So the lines passing through the origin. Okay. So zero zero is the identity. So this is my group one. This is my group two. G one. Right. G one plus G two is also R two. Okay, so you can now represent any point that you pick here. Okay, as some element H1 from group G1 and some element H2 from group G2. Okay. X and Y axis are just one example of groups G1 and G2. All right. So this is what is called a direct sum. Okay. In the case, in the definition of sum of subgroups, there is no requirement that the intersection is only the identity. Okay? But if H1 and H2 are subgroups such that their intersection is only identity, then the sum of H1 and H2, okay, remember this does not require H1 plus H2 to be G. Okay? Direct sum of H1 and H2 is defined if H1 intersection H2 is identity. And the notation is this. Is that clear? Direct sum ensures that the representation is unique. That is sort of the take home message. And this is something that all of us have been using quite since Cartesian geometry was introduced to us. Okay, why? I mean, we're so comfortable using coordinates, right? But uh, underlying that comfort is the fact that you cannot have two different coordinates for the same point. Why? Because your x and y axis, they give a direct sum. 
because the only point which is both on the x and y axis is the origin okay that is why that is the only reason why we have been able to use it so we'll stop here for today any questions so far sir if we take a line x equals 1 and y equals 1 as a h1 h2 then will it gives direct no, sum no it's not even a subgroup right this x this is uh, y equals 1 this is x equals 1 these are not subgroups because the identity doesn't belong to this set that clear one yes sir and sir the polar coordinate system polar um, coordinate system again uh, unfortunately r equals 1 for example that's not a right the unit circle is not a subgroup under the additive group but you can sort of think of it as r and theta in the like so sir so polar coordinate system will be a subgroup for a group g uh, r square means r cross r for multiplication Where, no, uh, no, no, zero no, 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 because R square is not a group under multiplication. Means uh, excluding zero comma zero. Uh, excluding zero comma zero. No, because zero comma one. What would be the inverse? so we must exclude both x and y axis uh yeah so that is why it's not a nice way to look at right r to under multiplication you have to eliminate several things okay okay sir okay so we we'll stop here and i really hope we can hello sir next class yes mart i got your email it's okay maybe you can submit your scribe notes by tuesday okay thank you sir okay see you guys by the way uh, sorry uh, tomorrow there will be no tutorial something that i forgot to announce tomorrow there is no tutorial several of your classmates have already left the meeting uh, i hope you can spread the good news sir yes